And so a very good morning to everyone. Morning. Uh, well, weather's decent. Thank you for coming out in the nice weather. Um, of course, it is predicted this week as the children go back to school again uh, and we get into autumn, we have the summer weather, which is, uh, which is really great. But thank you for coming. Thank you for not driving off to the coast or going to uh, do barbecues and the like. So in a moment, we're going to be uh, opening our service with worship. First of all, let's just uh, set aside the business of the world and uh, think about the reasons that we're here. Um, and from the Book of Common Worship, we're told that we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. For God is good. Good morning, everyone. Today we're reading Romans 12, and we're starting at verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning. Um, my name's Steve. I'm one of the members of the church here and uh, church warden um, over at our sister church, Holy Trinity, um, as is Bob. So it's a sort of lines down takeover this morning, which we didn't really plan for that, but I um, hope that's been okay. Um, I always have a, a moment of anxiety whenever I'm speaking here, and, and it's... Um, it's that I'll be sitting there having prepared what I'm going to say, and then someone gets up to do the reading, and it's a different reading. <laughs> and I've prepared the wrong thing. I always have it. I never check on what the reading is. So it was the right reading. Uh, I've, I've never quite worked out, yeah, I've never quite worked out how I'll style it out the day that happens. I'll probably just go, and, uh, for our, and now I'm going to read our second reading, and, and, and I just hope nobody notices the difference, but we're all right today. Um, so, um, so today, um, well, the topic is, is, is love, right? Um, and I think we're going to have a couple of slides up to start um, today. Um, the topic is love, and I did read uh, that this love is apparently the most sung about topic in, I think it was, I think this survey said in, in, in like all forms of music. Um, so I thought a good way to start looking at the topic was that we're going to have a music quiz to start. Because um, I looked up a few things that our singers uh, say about love. Um, let's, this is a brand new clicker, so we hope it's going to work. And it isn't. You might have to slide us, Ros. There's nothing happening here. Um, okay, so um, so I'm gonna we're gonna put a uh, song title up. I just want to know who, who sung it. So, "Love Me Tender," that's Elvis Presley. Good. Put it, we put that up. What about "Love Me Do"? It's 
weird sentiment. Love me, do. I don't really know what that's saying uh, or adding to that. Um, but yeah, the Beatles, next one. Now, love me for a reason. Yeah, I'll take two answers. I'll take the Osmonds. Who covered it? Boyzone, very good, yeah. Love me for a reason. What's that about? It's like, I want you to love me, but only if you've got a specific reason. Don't love me without a reason, very bizarre. Um, love me again, getting more modern now. Testing the age of the room. No, okay, that's John Freeman, isn't it? John Newman. Um, love me more. Oh, there's not enough young people in this church. Uh, no, pop the answers up. Sam Smith, that was about love me harder. Love me, but love me harder. I don't know what, don't know what she's saying with that. Um, go on, answers. We're going to have to do all the answers here. That was Ariana Grande. And love me like you do. Hmm? Ellie Goulding. Yeah, good. Finally, we got one in the end. Um, got there. So lots of, lots of ways to love me. Um, I want to think about the people you love. Do you love them for a reason or love them more or harder? But we talk, we talk a lot about this. Um, but love, when you look at uh, society and love, there can be good and bad outcomes from our love. Um, I noticed a, a, a while back um, Donald Trump, right, talking about his, you know, his presidential ambitions because he loves America. Now, I'm not going to comment on his politics. So it's not a political soapbox. You can say what you like about his politics. But one thing I don't think you can disagree with is that his love for America has led to probably the greatest you know, split and separation, political polarization that country's seen for about 60 years. So not necessarily the outcome he was looking for. And um, Putin's love for Russia has led to all sorts of things in the last two years. Um, so um, the way the world looks at love in lots of different ways has lots of different outcomes. And in this passage, Paul is writing to the church in Rome about love. And that's a topic of several letters that Paul writes. In fact, you see a repeated pattern when Paul talks about love. Um, Romans 12 is structured very, very similar in a similar way to the Corinthians 12, his letter to the church in Corinth. And in both of those situations, um, he talks about gifts first, our spiritual gifts and the things and the skills that we have and the ways we can serve. So ways in which we can do things for others, to express our love. And in both of those situations, he then goes on to talk about what true love is. Um, and that's what he does in this. So we are going to, um, so it's essentially his foundation is that we can't do those things for others if our love is not sincere or our love is not genuine. Um, we're going to focus on unwrapping that first verse a bit. If we can put the slides back on, um, as you did so well in the um, uh, music quiz, you get the ancient Greek quiz now. And I think you'll be all right with this, right? It's not as scary as it sounds. Um, because I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the, the the first. This is this is the literal translation of that first verse that we heard in in the reading. Let your love be sincere. Um, so, um, but what we have is I, I want you to again. Can you just pop the um, pop the build on, Ross? Um, the hey is let your. So so what's agape? You familiar with that word? That's the Greek word for love, right? The love that you probably heard there. That's the 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 deep love between God and his people that is represented by us. And then, what's that, what do you think that final word means? It's not a trick question. Unhypocritical. Yeah, anhypocritos is the Greek word in this verse, and it literally means unhypocritical. That first verse, let your love be sincere, or let your love be genuine, is literally, let your love be unhypocritical. Um, so this is what Paul is talking about. Paul hates hypocrisy. He writes about it a lot. Um, he talks about um, uh, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law at the time, being hypocr hypocritical. He even uh, accuses Peter of being hypocritical. So that's Peter, who Jenny talked about last week, being the rock on the church the church is founded. Paul said he's a hypocrite. Um, so what we'll do this morning, first we'll look at what hypocrisy is is and try to just unwrap that term 
Um, and then we're going to get into what Paul was describing as the, you know, the opposite, what, what a genuine, non-hypocritical love looks like. Um, the dictionary definition of hypocrisy is not that satisfactory. Uh, it says, assuming false appearance of virtue. Um, I prefer a story that I heard um, about a driver in the, the US who um, was pulled over by a police officer and was very angry about being pulled over. Now, it's quite dangerous in the US to be angry at a police officer, but this driver was. Um, and the driver said, why have you pulled me over? Why have you pulled me over? I've done nothing wrong. Uh, and the police officer says, well, I just, I just noticed that um, when you overtook that slow-moving vehicle, um, you know, you were, you were very angry and you were waving your fist out of the, the car window. Um, and the person said, well, that's not against the law. What, why did you pull me over? And the police officer says, well, then I noticed that when that other, sm that other car cut you off, um, you know, you, you, you shouted, you, you beeped your horn, and you raised your finger out the window at the other driver. Um, and the driver said, well, that's not against the law either. Why did you pull me over? Uh, and the police officer said, well, then I noticed the Jesus loves you sticker on the back of your car, and I assumed the car must be stolen. <laughs> Is your car stolen, sir? And you can imagine the guy's reaction, right? Um, hypocrisy is that inconsistency, right? The difference between what we're saying and what we're doing. Um, to, to go into it in, in, in a deeper way, I had to resort to my favorite bit of bedtime reading, which is the European Journal of Social Psychology. Any other, no readers of that? No, I'm the only one who reads that. Um, and um, actually they, uh, a couple of researchers did some work to try to unpick, you know, how we use that term. Are there different types of hypocrisy? And, and they believe there are four types. And it's interesting, as you examine some of the things that Paul wrote and Jesus said, you see all these types of hypocrisy portrayed in, in, in the way the Bible talks about it as well. So let me just kind of quickly run you through those. Um, the first is this idea of inconsistency. Right? In our terms, it's not practicing what you preach or not walking the talk. Right? It's about when you take a position where there's rules for others, but you're kind of somehow above them or it's different for you. This is why we all got so angry about the lockdown parties. Right? How dare they have parties in number 10 Downing Street? Because we're all keeping the rules. Were we? Well, I was doing two forms of exercise a day because I walked the dog twice, so I, I, I wasn't. But we got angry because we felt you are, you've got, you're running yourself at a different standard to us. How dare you? Um, I don't know how they got, personally, lockdown parties confused with, with, uh, with work events, which seem to be the issue. Either, either their parties are terrible or they have amazing work events. I don't know how, they, how you can confuse the two. Um, um, but um, we see this in the Bible as well, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'll give you all the references, but you don't need to run off and, and find them. I promise I'm just reading out what is there. Um, in, in Luke, um, I'm going to look at Luke chapter 13, um, verse 14, uh, where we have, um, this, is, um, this is teachers of the law and, uh, um, and the Pharisees. Um, they were indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, uh, so come and be healed on those days. Don't come on the Sabbath. Right? Don't be healed on, on our holy day. Go and do that on some other day of the week. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, um, be set free from the Sabbath from what bound her? There was, you know, they were, they were saying, what you're doing is, you know, is, is, is work. You're, you know, he was looking after a woman who needed help. And he said, well, you look after your donkey on a Sunday. You're still going to feed and water the donkey. Why can't I, like, look after people? Isn't that better? There was a double standard. There was an inconsistency that Jesus pointed out. We hate inconsistencies like that. I got really angry. Not really angry, but I got, I got annoyed uh, uh, at a cricket game recently I was at where there was a commentator from Sky TV uh, promoting their kind of green credentials and saying we really want to encourage everybody to walk to the ground for the cricket today um, and 
this commentator was Australian. They'd flown from Australia to England to, to, to comment on a game, to talk about a game, and they told us all to walk to the ground. And I just thought, how dare you tell me to walk from London to Manchester to go and see the cricket? Um, if I start getting angry about all the footballs that come over from the back garden from the boys next door, you know, I used to do that myself, right? Can I legitimately be angry about that? No. So inconsistency is is first form of hypocrisy. Um, then there's pretense, um, which is which is faking it. It's pretending. It's painting yourself to be something you're not. Um, if inconsistency comes from a position of belief superiority, pretense comes from pride. Right, it's wanting to appear better than we are. Um, there's a horrible story in the news at the moment about um, uh, a lady that's been running a parenting blog. Um, I think it was, it was, there was one called Connections, there was another called Eight Passengers, right? She's been running this parenting website and she's been arrested for child abuse. But she's been putting herself out there as an expert in parenting and has got hundreds of thousands of followers but secretly, what's been happening behind the scenes is she's been mistreating her own children. But she's been putting on that pretense. Um, for a, a, a biblical example I, I wanted to read out on this was, um, again, some, some words from Jesus that Matthew records in Matthew chapter 23, um, where he says, um, uh, And Jesus said to the crowds, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to, to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. This is just how they're decorating themselves. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and have men call them rabbi. So it's when we put appearance first, when we hide what's real and put on appearances. Um, Jesus called the Pharisees at one point whitewashed tombs, which is strange terminology. It's a grave that you've painted to look pretty. It's a really horrific insult in these times to call somebody that because what the Pharisees were concerned about was their ritual cleanliness. All of this portrayal was to go, look how holy I am, how holy I am. look how I follow the rules. Um, about the most unclean thing you could do was touch a dead body in Jewish society. By so calling someone a whitewashed tomb, it's saying you're basically f you're full of dead bodies. They're in, they're, you're not only touching them, they're inside you, and you've washed over that. It's a, it's a tremendous insult that Jesus levied at the, um, uh, at the Pharisees because to him, hypocrisy... Um, was so bad. Um, the third is, is blame. This is where we, you know, we're not only hiding something, but we see faults in others that we carry ourselves, and we're bold enough to point those out. Um, so, um, and, and there are various sort of verses about this. Um, you might be familiar with the term, you know, take the, take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's, right? That's a biblical reference as well. Um, in John 8, um, some of you will know the, the, the story um, where the teachers of the law bring somebody accused of adultery before Jesus. I'm going to read this out. I think this is a really important reference. Um, uh, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Moses commands us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They're using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning, he straightened up and said, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. And they walked away one at a time. It's easier, it's easier to spot the faults in others uh, than examine our own. It's intellectually lazy of us. Um, a, um, an English preacher once traveled to the, to the US to, to speak and uh, he was preaching on the verse, um, Nehemiah was a great 
warrior, but he was a leper. Um, and his three, bear in mind this is an Englishman going to America, his three sermon points were, um, uh, each one of us has a but. Uh, it's easy to see your own, it's, sorry, it's easy to see other people's butts, but it's very difficult to see your own butt. Um, I don't know how the US interpreted that, but, um, but this is, you know, it's a, it's a hypocrisy message, right? We are, it's easy to spot things that other people are doing wrong, and it's a lot harder to self-reflect, and that's how we can slip into blame. The fourth sort of uh, sub-area of hypocrisy is, is complacency, which is, which is where we find an easier option to make us feel better about perhaps our, our guilt. Um, we replace a hard thing with an easy thing. Uh, for me, the illustration of this is, you know, you go to a, uh, you go to a fast food restaurant and you've got, your, um, you've got your plastic cutlery and they give you a plastic cup with a plastic lid and then they pop a paper straw in it because we're doing something for the environment, so we've moved to paper straws. You think, terrific, the world, the world will be saved thanks to paper straws. You know, it's, they, they're doing just the small thing. You know, it's hypocrisy to have all that other plastic, but the paper straw, either, either do it or don't do it, right? That's the sincerity and the genuine. Let's not play around with something small that's easy, right? Maybe we do that with our giving. Maybe you do it with this, you know, there's some difficult need the church does, but we'll pick an easy job and we'll do that. It's like, well, I'm helping out. Are we the paper straw? Um, Pharisees were, 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 were doing this all the time, it seems. Um, uh, when you examine the words of Jesus in, in Matthew 23, verse 23. Um, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but have neglected more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. You know, he's saying this big stuff, just, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You know, don't come in and say, here's a tenth of your spices. What kind of sacrifice is that, really? Well, I've got a bit less cumin this week. I can't quite make the curry. Um, so don't replace the difficult stuff with the easy and think we're okay. Um, so that's um, you know that's Paul's view um, and of hypocrisy and you know as illustrated by some elements of Jesus' life. So what is this you know what is this for us? I, I think look any time. I, it's difficult for me to stand here and kind of give give examples because then I feel kind of like well. Because this is me, right? Otherwise, I'm being a hypocrite standing here going, don't do all this, you know, knowing that this is all of us, right? But, you know, I sat and think, what, you know, what are some of the ways we might have to relate to this ourselves? Um, this could be, you know, criticizing someone for swearing when, when we're cruel with our words. Um, it could be being helpful to our friends but ignoring people we don't know who have need out on the street. Um, dodging difficult jobs for the easy jobs. Um, you know, moaning about the government should do more about climate change while we hold our paper, our, our sort of single-use coffee cup. Um, G Paul was saying, let your love be unhypocritical. And what does that actually look like? Well, he moves into a passage, as we heard read, where he describes actually what good looks like. And I think we should just read it again to refresh our memory of, of what, the unhypocritical, sincere love looks like. I'm going to highlight a couple of those verses. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That's a different word for love he uses there. That's not agape, that's philos. That's, this, that's the support, the friendliness, the companionship of colleagues and friends. Honor one another above yourselves. He's saying it's about being unselfish. Never be lacking in zeal and energy. Keep your spiritual fervor. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Just imagine a world that was like this. I'll carry on. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. 
live in harmony with one another. It, he closes it really with this phrase, which is, I want us to think about this, I think it's a very powerful statement. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. With all. Not just other Christians, or people like you, or people who share the same values as you. Live at peace with all. This is what Paul is describing is the Christian life and the Christian example of love in the world. We live at peace with all. Um, he's characterizing the opposite of being judging and disapproving. He's saying, don't go out and tell everybody they're wrong because you're, you're probably doing it yourself and you'll be a hypocrite. Live at peace with all. Do not judge. Why shouldn't we be judging and disapproving of others? Because God wasn't judging and disapproving of us. How do we tackle hypocrisy in ourselves? I suppose is the got two final thoughts as uh, as we close, and that's that's the first. You know, if if we if we're able to reflect on ourselves and think about it, how do we tackle it? Um, I have two thoughts on that. I think the first is sometimes it's about slowing down. Sometimes our hypocrisy is, is, is reacting to things. We should respond and not react. Take time. And in that time, ask yourself, could I be wrong? Hypocrisy tends to come from a place of superiority. I'm better or I know a bit more than somebody else. Um, so the antidote to that is humility. So it's taking that moment, slowing down and going, could I be wrong? Am I just as guilty before we point the finger? There's, some, there's something called imposter syndrome. People have heard of imposter syndrome, um, which is kind of the term now given to that um, feeling that you're kind of not worthy to be doing something. You know, you, you have to lead a team and you go to go, well, I'm not sure I'm good enough to do that. Or um, uh, it's, and uh, it's a you know, common form of lack of, lack of confidence. Um, I coach people in my job and a lot of times people have got, um, you know, come and they say, yeah, I, I can relate to imposter syndrome. I've come to see imposter syndrome actually as a real positive because I also know people who have the opposite of imposter syndrome. Think about what the opposite is. The opposite is you feel you're above all this and you're so good at it, they're barely worthy of you. Um, I have American colleagues that call it um, armchair quarterback syndrome, the opposite. It's like, you know, I, I just know how to do everything. Quarterback's the one that controls the game of American football, right? The opposite of imposter syndrome is, is worse than having imposter syndrome. So when someone says, I've got imposter syndrome, I go, good because your heart's in the right place. It means your basic start point is humility. And you're better off there than somewhere else. You can learn a bit of confidence where you need it from a place of humility. So how do we tackle hypocrisy? Let's start from a place of humility and go, you know what, I don't know everything. Um, and I don't know that person's situation before we start judging somebody else for what they do or their lifestyle or their choices or anything else that they may have done. Um, the second and, and final question I, I thought of looking at this topic was, okay, we, we can recognize it, we can start to try to tackle it in ourselves. Can we remove all hypocrisy? Let's face it, when I think when you read that passage, brotherly love, joyful in hope, always zeal, joy in other people's joys, rejoice with those who rejoice instead of being jealous, live in harmony with everybody. Let's face it, that's going to be impossible, right? Probably, yeah. But that doesn't matter. Paul tells us to try and that if our hearts are right, we can actually lean on the main message of this letter to Romans, which is grace. God doesn't expect us to achieve all of that. Maybe Paul did. He seemed a pretty demanding guy. Um, but, um, you know, God, you know, in his grace knows that if our hearts are in the right place 
and we're trying to be genuine in our love, uh, then his grace is big enough to cover all the mistakes. I'm going to say a prayer and then uh, the band are going to come up and we're going to have a, a, a quieter song as we reflect. And do use the, use the song to either join in the words um, or to just take that time to think about your life and things you may want to reflect on. Father God, we, if we humbly come before you recognizing that in our lives there is hypocrisy. We confess we can have expectations of others that we don't even meet ourselves. We know there'll be times where we're inconsistent. Lord, help us to see those times. Help us to recognize it when we're doing it. And Lord, grant us the humility to respond and be patient and learn to live in peace with all people. And Lord, when we fail, forgive us, Father. Forgive us as we repent and seek to be sincere in our love. Amen.